Our next speaker is Mark Fauchet with Dedupe on ButterFS. Hello. Uh, so my name is Mark Fauchet. I work at SUSE. Uh, I work on file systems at SUSE. I am the maintainer of the OCFS2 cluster file system. Uh, I work on ButterFS quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I do general file system stuff at SUSE for SUSE Labs. <coughs> So the talk uh, today is on deduplication, uh, and you know, in order to talk about deduplication, we should define it. Um, and quite literally, we're talking about just removing duplicates of data. So nothing super complicated there. Um, this happens across files, across the file system, um, which differs from, say, compression when you think of like making a zip file or something like that, or even file-based compression within the file system, right? So that's you know, like a lot of people might ask, like, well, how does this differ from compression, right? And that's, that's basically it. So conceptually, it's just we're leaving the data alone. Not really, because we're blowing away half of it, right, and pointing everything back to the to one copy. But uh, conceptually, like, the stream is intact. We're not compressing it, decompressing it or anything. There's two forms of dedupe that we looked at. Um, and it, generally, there's two forms of dedupe. So there's inline dedupe, and that happens in the right path of the file system or the block device. So mostly in this talk, I'll talk about the file system, but there are block devices that dedupe on that level, right? Um, in any rate, uh, when you're doing it in line, right, that means that the right path has to calculate some checksums, uh, you know, and potentially maintain a table of duplicated hashes, right? So that's going to impact your write performance. Uh, the, uh, I'd say the trade-off you get is that you're dedupe right away. So in theory, you know, if you start with an empty device and you're deduping as you're writing to it, you would never write the same thing twice, right? So that's your trade-off, right? If you want to trade some write performance to always just get the maximum deduplication, you would do that. Uh, Out-of-band dedupe is basically happening later. So we let the data get written to the disk, right? And at a later point, the admin or whoever is responsible for the data decides this is what I want to do, right? Um, so because it's a deferred process, you have no impact on the performance of your of your writes. Uh, the downside, of course, is that temporarily you're using more space than you will later, right? Because you'll do it later, basically. Does that make sense to everybody? Straightforward. Cool. All right, and just raise your hand if you have a question. I guess that would be the easiest way to do it. Uh, so we had customers asking about deduplication at SUSE, uh, and ButterFS is a natural fit for something like deduplication. Uh, the reason uh, that it is a natural fit is because it has to ref count its extents, right? Um, so already ButterFS understands the concept of, uh, you know, one extent being shared amongst multiple files, right? And usually, like, you're creating, like, maybe a snapshot or something or cloning an extent, and this is essentially just the reverse of that process, right? Where instead of cloning it and, and, and uh, taking an extent and putting it maybe in another subvolume or point, pointing to it from another subvolume, right, we're just, uh, well, we're taking the pointers. And essentially, I guess what I'm trying to get at is at the end of the day, it looks the same on disk, basically, right? It's, it's just kind of another... Uh, another use of, of the extent pointers that they have. Does that make sense? I know that was a little... Okay. Uh, the other good reason is because we support it at SUSE, so uh, obviously, you know, that's, that's where I'm going to look first. Um, and I've been asked to tell you guys that we have four engineers that work on ButterFS at SUSE. Uh, I'm one of them. Um, and it's actually a pretty good number. I would say we have very good coverage of, of bugs and features and whatnot. So um, that kind of describes a little more of my background, I guess. I started on ButterFS just with that sort of bug fixing, adding features that we needed, right? And then it turned into like, okay, now that we've got things stable and we can ship it and give it to customers to use, what are those sorts of next steps we want to do, right? Um, and that's, that's the advantage that they have at my organization, right, is we've got a lot of people working on it. And we can do that sort of thing, basically. All right. So uh, before I get into the nuts and bolts of how we dedupe, I wanted to describe uh, how extents are laid out on ButterFS. So uh, the actual data is, is laid out pretty much as you would expect an extent on any extent file system. So there's no header or anything. It's just on disk, right, at some offset with some length, right? Uh, ButterFS maintains what's called an extent tree, and this is global for the file system, right? And this is 
keeping sort of those, uh, it's keeping track of all of those extents on disk, right? Uh, and that includes things like ref counts on the extents, right? Um, if you have an inoded ButterFS and it wants to point to some data, right, it uses, it has its own item, right, an extent data item, right, and that points directly to the extent, okay. Um, now the reason, the reason we do this is because we can keep the extent tracking separate from, say, snapshotting, right. So when you create a snapshot, right, all you're doing is you're creating new extent data items, right, uh, that are pointing to the actual extent on disk, right. That follow? Does everyone follow? Yeah, I had limited time. I think a graph or a picture might have been a little better. Um, so that gets to basically the process of cloning extent, right? So if you were to ask ButterFS, look, I have this extent in one file, and I want this extent to be cloned into the other file, right? And let's ignore what happens. Well, what happens to the data that it gets cloned over is that it gets thrown away, right? But you're fine with that, right? So essentially, that's what ButterFS is going to do. Is it's just going to rewrite that little extent data item, and it's going to point it to the extent that you asked for, right? Okay. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the extent, uh, so the extent tree is global, right? That's tracked. Mm -hmm. So that's tracking all the extent. Why do you need it? Because the inodes are yeah. doing the same thing, right? Yeah, 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 right, right. It's it's a good question. Um, so you're doing that because you you don't want to keep all the ref counts and all of that sort of global metadata, uh, you know, spread out amongst multiple snapshots. So you keep that in the extent tree, right? Does that answer the the question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, yeah. you have different information. So, like, when you have another example of why you do it separately is when you describe the extent in the extent tree, you're just saying, well, this extent lies at this offset on the disk and for this length, right? When you describe it for a file, well, you have additional information, like, well, where's the offset within the file that this extent is located at, right? Yeah, so that stuff, you know, as you can imagine, right, it would get really messy to have that all in one place. So, yeah. So, yeah, make better sense. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, now with the background on ButterFS, uh, I'll talk just how I implemented dedupe. Um, we chose to do out of band. Uh, most of the people we talked to were not interested in sacrificing their right performance. Uh, there are actually patches for doing it in band on on the list today, actually. So that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there, your choice with the in-band is going to be using a lot of memory or maintaining a table on disk, basically, right? Uh, and you're going to be computing checksums while you're doing the writes. So we chose to forego all of that, right? Um, one, because a lot of customers were not too happy about the idea of losing write performance. Uh, the other one is it's, it's just a lot more simple, too. Hacking the write path can get complicated. It's very performance sensitive. Um, and it just seemed easier and better, basically, to do it via nioctal uh, and just do it later. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, so that's the idea. And then when you, it, it's it's a good idea, right? And that's and that's kind of where I'm going with the out of bandy dupe, right? The idea is that that's giving you the flexibility, right? The, the admin can know, okay, hey, look, we're not busy between midnight and 4 a.m., right? So now is when we're gonna run our dedupe for something like that. Or maybe you have some better intelligence, right, that's, that's monitoring the system and knows this is when I wanna run my dedupe process. The reason that we keep it out of kernel at that point is because there's, there's no longer any reason to have it in the kernel, basically, if that makes sense. So putting it in the kernel at that point is just, you know, adding a lot of complexity and potential bugs and stuff, so. But yeah, yeah, that's a very good idea. And that is ultimately where I'm going with my project is, is for it to be run as a daemon, you know, when you want your dedupe, so. Um, okay, so yeah, so that was, that goes over why we chose to do out of band. Uh, the other things that I realized uh, when I was doing the dedupe, the dedupe, excuse me, uh, is that no matter what, you can always have collisions. Uh, no matter what checksumming you do, no matter how strong it is, there's always collisions, it could be compromised. Uh, people, one thing I have learned, people are very unforgiving if you corrupt their data. Like the one thing I have learned in file systems, you do not do that. So because of that, don't trust the checksums, right? Yeah, go on, please.
Yeah, I mean, I would assume there's still some mathematical probability, right? Yeah. 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 But then you go, okay, well, you use, like, uh, what, what was I using? Initially, I was using SHA-256, which is way overkill. Uh, it, you'll, I'll get to it later, but that wound up being way overkill for my purposes. But, um, yeah, yeah, I would say my, my response to that would be that I, I could tell that to a customer, and then they say, so there's still a chance it might corrupt, right? Yeah. So you just, you don't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Because uh, this gets corrupted all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and in my opinion, if you have file system uh, probability, right, uh, on deadwood is uh, of collision is much lower than your hardware probability, right? Then you're not going to uh, add up. So, yeah, so, okay, okay, I see, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I would agree with that. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree, I agree, yeah. It's just, it's, we can't say, you know, yeah, no matter what chance someone is, gets upset, basically, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I, I mean, I generally agree with you. Um, it does mean, though, it does free you up to do some neat things, because you don't need really strong checksums anymore. So that's kind of nice. By the way, checksums on the file system level are not there for detecting duplicates of data, though, right? As you, you probably understand that, actually. They're there for detecting errors, right? And the reason I bring that up, not because of anything specifically you said, but a lot of people come to me and they ask, hey, why aren't you using the ButterFS checksums for this, right? And that's one of the big reasons is, well, they're there to detect errors. They're not there well, yeah, to tell you, yeah. Really weak because there's a yeah. Going and right? Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, okay. I'm going to take a sip, but it answers your question, though, more or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I, 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 I agree, but it's, yeah, I have to take care of it. Yeah, I, I can't do otherwise, basically. Um, so, so ultimately, though, what that means is that if, when we get into the kernel, we do compare, byte by byte. We make sure, okay, if you're asking to deduplicate this data, right, that, you know, <laughs> the page is absolutely the same on either end before we do that. So, yeah. That's that's the promise you can give, basically, right? You say, no, we're we're checking. This is a you know. So. Yes, you don't want to have your marketing folks to have you for the problem for not not, right? <laughs> no, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, so this is the IOTL I came up with, mm. uh, and it's it's pretty straightforward actually. Um, you just you give a target file uh, with an offset and a length, and then you do the same thing. You just you have a nice fat array with a bunch of FDs in it, uh, and you send up a request and you say, "Hey, I'd like all of these files deduped, right?" Uh, and it these offsets and whatnot. Um, as I as I already uh, described, the IOP tool will go in there and it does a byte by byte compare. So there's no hashing that happens there. It's just a mem mem comp basically, right? Uh, so what it's allowing is, is that allows you to do the hashing in user space however you want, right? You want to store it in a file, you store it in a file, you want to keep it in memory, keep it in memory, use this, use that, you know. Uh, just discussing which hash to use, I've had maybe four or five patches of different hashes because everyone has their favorite hash or their favorite checksum algorithm and stuff. So um, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, like I said, it's pretty straightforward. It does everything under lock. Um, it returns whether you've deduped or not, so that the user space understands, you know, okay, has that compare failed, right? Uh, was there any other reason why you couldn't dedupe, right? There might be like permissions issue or whatnot. whatnot. Um, it's entirely possible for a file to change in between when you call into the kernel and you have to dedupe it and, and when the actual dedupe runs and whatnot. So uh, we got handle all of those things, basically. Um, internally, we just use most of the clone code. Uh, clone is in the ButterFS IOCTL, and I, um, I basically touched on it before, but it's, it's the way ButterFS ex exports to user space the ability to move, or not to move, to copy extents from one file to another, right? So all we're doing basically is saying, uh, you know, we're just doing the compare, and then we're just cloning one extent over the other and letting it all fall out from the clone code, basically. And clone code already handles that and knows to orphan the extent that gets overwritten and everything. Uh, so makes our life easy and shares bug fixes, which is nice. So, oh, any, any questions on that? Okay. Take that as a good sign. Uh, so, so 
Yeah, please, please. The question here is, yeah. so you're speaking about the banks, right? The yeah. banks are pretty large. Mm. They can be, yeah. yeah. So, so what is it for? Is it for one bank or how much? Oh, for butter FS? Yes. No, it's 4K. Oh, so 4K is a different. Yeah. The, that would be the minimum extent size, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So, so, so that the compare happens on 4K boundary, right? Well, <coughs> excuse me. Um, no. So that's in, that that goes ahead. Actually, as a, a, a slide, uh, I do it on 128K. Uh, I'd be happy to explain why, if you'd like to know. If you want to know, I take it. Uh, so when we're doing uh, when we're doing all the I/O um, and all the check summing. Uh, we, the, the, my dupe remove program, the user space software, has the op option, right? You can do up from 4K up to 1 meg, basically, right? The I.O., the checksumming, everything just slows down a lot if you're chunking it up into 4K chunks. Additionally, uh, you really start to fragment, you know, uh, your, your, I would say your risk of fragmentation gets higher, right? So it's kind of a balancing act of how quickly do our, we want our I.O. to happen, right? And uh, how much would we like to avoid fragmenting the file system? So, um, and I actually didn't have like a great answer right off the bat, right? So I'm, you know, I'm talking to my boss about this. I'm talking to other engineers, and really, I just experimented a lot, did a lot of runs, uh, you know, at different block sizes, and looked around actually, and looked at what other software did. 128k seemed to be pretty common for like a dedupe a default DDU block size, if that makes sense, yeah. So from user space, uh, you know, the block size that you compare at is basically up to, you know, up to the user defaults at 128. Internally, the file system absolutely can have extents, you know, 4K to, uh, I want to say 256 megs would be the biggest extent. I want to say that, so. Uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Or? Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, yeah. Uh, so if you want to check this out, it's on it's on GitHub. Uh, this is this is the user space part, right? Uh, the kernel part is in the kernel, um, and if you guys want later, I can show you the kernel code. Uh, uh, yeah. Do I get it right that the user space has to figure out first what needs to be duplicated, yeah. and then the kernel will be duplicated, but before doing so, it checks that the user space was basically correct. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Does yeah. that mean that I.O. happens twice uh -huh. or not? No, that means that for, for your duplicated blocks, yes, the I.O. happens twice, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah I won't lie, I'm not going <laughs> to <laughs> Actually, we magically do it only, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, yeah. I mean, if you're reading that from user space without or direct, the data should be in cache or yeah. the kernel doesn't use the page cache. No, 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 the kernel uses the page cache. Okay. Yeah, so absolutely, yeah. So it's hopefully. Unless, I mean, yeah. That doesn't mean that I.O. will happen twice because probably. Right. The worst case is. Unless the page cache is destroyed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The worst case would be that you do the I.O. twice. Uh, average case just depends on your set. If your yeah. set is yeah, if your set is way bigger than your memory, probably it's going to happen twice. If it's smaller than your memory, yeah. it's okay. going to yeah, make sense. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see, so dupe remove, uh, by standard file-based interface, I just want to get across that it's a, like your standard Unix program. I try to make it as close to, you know, CAT or CP, anything like that. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I, you mentioned that it, was, it depends on your file and version of working set, right? So uh, then it uh, found some, something to be due, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I right now do do, do remove scans everything builds extents from the scan blocks and then submits them. Okay, so, so it doesn't do just that. Uh, but if you don't mind, I'm going to write that down because that's actually a pretty good <laughs> idea. Um, submit it right away. The reason it doesn't submit it right away right now is because we don't know ahead of time, right, how many because I want to cram as many dedupes in one uh, ioctal as I can. So I don't know ahead of time like how many duplicates I would find, right? But uh, there's there's a possibility of doing that in the future. I have a feature where, uh, again, we're getting ahead, but it's okay I, as long as everyone's okay with that. Uh, I have a feature where DupeRoom can write them to disk in a hash file. So that'd be nice later for when we scan the hash file or something. Um, I have a feature coming up where 
I will use the hash file and I will store transaction IDs in the hash file so then I can just query ButterFS based on a subvolume and say, hey, what is the last transaction ID on this subvolume? And then I'll, and ButterFS will be able to tell me then which files have changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the, uh, I'd say that's probably the last feature, the last big feature I had in my head to make, you know, to, to complete the project, I guess. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Any, any more questions? Or, uh, straightforward. Okay, cool. Good. Um, most of you have deduced this already, actually, but uh, yeah, so the, the uh, dupe remove basically works on a three step process, right? So you have a file scan stage. Uh, and I, we know over why we use 128K default. Um, you can optionally use a temporary file. Uh, I, I recommend this. Um, so one of the lessons I learned also is if you don't do this, you will eat an enormous amount of memory. So I'd say about a, maybe 18 months ago, uh, I, had to, I had to work something in basically because we were finally hitting data sets. I was finally hitting data sets. We're like, oh wow, okay, you know, like this is more hashes than I have memory for basically, right? Um, so now you can, you can use a temporary file and that expands the amount of the space you you know you can scan basically by a ton. Um, we then take all of the duplicated blocks and I make extents out of them. And this goes back to wanting to reduce the number of ioctals I'm calling into, right? So I have an enormous table of extents that are duplicated, right? I'm sorry, I should say blocks that are duplicated, right? Uh, and what I what basically what I do is find all the dupes that create, you know a multi-block chain, essentially, right? And I submit those together. So two reasons for that. One is in the interest of, you know, calling into the kernels a few times. Secondly, I'm also just trying not to fragment, basically, right? So I don't want to have, like, you know, a meg and then be chunking it out into 128K dupes, right? I want to coalesce all those 128K blocks that I have and turn it into a meg and then dedupe that. So that's, that would be the intermediate step. And then the last step is essentially an enormous loop of calling to the kernel, you know, ask for a dedupe, get back my status, and, and, and whatnot. Um, yeah, and then the, uh, the hash file is actually uh, wound up being really useful for testing. So uh, I actually have in instructions on the wiki for people if they like to just see how much, uh, you know, how quick a step, right, uh, one of the stages is, or, you know, how their hardware handles it, they can, they can isolate the three-step process, right? And write everything into a hash file first. And then dedupe from that hash file, right? And then my great feature is eventually we'll tie all that together, and then you can run it with the hash file that you had from your last run, and it'll just dynamically update it. So hopefully by next year, you know, when I do this talk, I'll have that. Um, a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but I've had some people use it uh, for things other than dedupe because it can just hash a lot of, of files very quickly, which has been pretty neat. So uh, just an interesting, interesting point. Any questions about sort of the high-level view of so you, you Yeah, please. About, uh, the files. Yeah. So Oh, no, 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 it's paralyzed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thread the heck out of everything I can, yeah. The step, in fact, if, if you want to know, uh, basically the, f the first and last steps, the file scan and the dedupe steps are, are heavily threaded. So I'll, as many CPUs as you have or as you tell me I can use, I'll, I'll make that many threads. The extent search, I've not been able to thread it yet. It's, ext it's actually very CPU intensive too. Yeah, because it's literally not allocating memory. It's not going to disk. At that point, it's just walking this immense data structure and putting extents together. Um, so it's actually led into some discussions of maybe allowing people to optionally skip that step. If they're fine with just just setting a bunch of raw blocks to dedupe later. So, um, yeah, but yeah, the first two steps are heavily, heavily threaded. That's where I got an enormous amount of performance. That, picking a better hash helped a lot too. A bunch of things, so. Any more questions about this stuff? Cool. So uh, yeah, most people the first that they want to know is like, okay, well, how how fast does it work? How much dedupe do I get? So this is my test. The test I do is basically I copy my home directory to a test machine, or I copy slash home to a test machine, and I run dupe remove against it, right? 
so right now it's uh, you know it's about 107 excuse me about 750 gigabytes takes about 45 minutes 44 and change basically yeah um, so that's about like what an hour a terabyte or something like that that's fully scanning it categorizing deduping it um, last year at the talk that took two hours and then before that it didn't finish it so this is a, yeah yeah again just a, uh, you know part of the talk is I just want to explain like sort of this, the evolution of this project right and that definitely was one of the the evolutions like the very first thing anyone ever asked was how quick is it and how much can it dedupe basically yeah so yeah and this is it also gives you a decent idea of like what you might see on, on a home directory, right? So 70 gigs, 750 gigabytes, you know, what, about 10%-ish, right? And my home directory, I'm, I'm, obviously I'm not gonna share the logs of it, <laughs> but it's, it's mostly, uh, just mostly, uh, you know, photos, uh, music, your usual stuff. Yeah, yeah right, I'm not, yeah, not, not gonna share the hash file of my home directory, but yeah, I'm, I'm desperately looking for something. I want something that has like the exact same pattern but is not my data, you know what I'm saying, that I could put up somewhere. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, I was actually surprised, 70 gigs, it's, it's not bad for, for what I thought was pretty, like, not deduplicatable, you know? Um, so, yeah, yeah. I don't have source code, and I have a separate partition for my source code, but source code doesn't deduplicate that great either, I found out, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the my big feature for the next revision. So version 11 should have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's where I'm at now. I've got it to where everything else is fast enough now that that's something that can be on the horizon. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I'll use that using transaction IDs from ButterFS, basically. If you use, if anyone has used the ButterFS find new command, uh, it's essentially the same thing. Yeah, you can give it a sub volume and it'll tell you like what has changed. It's pretty sweet actually. It's really cool. Yeah, please. Yeah, right. So that's, uh, I have someone I know on the ButterFS IRC channel that is doing something along those lines. Um, I could do that, yeah. Right now my idea is to have it something you run, right, and then maybe uh, it'd be run by another demon, right, uh, uh, you know, so then you would run it and then keep the logs somewhere. But it's, it's not a bad idea, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know at least one other person who's doing that with their own custom demon. They have uh, they have a really specific use case, and I haven't actually gotten the code from them. I think they're just keeping it to themselves, which is fine. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely yeah, it's a good idea. So yeah, I'm not sure if I'll get to that or not. Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, so use cases, um, I say medium size because I I don't want to overpromise. Like you know, so you have a good idea, right? You do terabyte in an hour, so maybe pointing it at a petabyte, uh, maybe not yet, right? Um, but yeah, um, I say medium size because I don't want to overpromise. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Oh, just once, just once. Yeah. It'll make no difference, or sometimes you'll discover a little bit more. And uh, there was a good reason for that, and I don't quite remember. Um, it actually has, to, I think it has to do with the extent search, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's generally what you would expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll get it out, and, and that's basically it. Um, yeah. So virtual machine images was actually one of the first use cases that was that was presented with, uh, and it's, it's. I say sometimes uh, people just need to be aware that this is fragmenting your your virtual machine image, right? So for for a lot of people, if it's mostly read only or something like that, that's great. They love it then, right? But if you have like a really busy disk, you probably don't want to do this. Make sense? Last thing, I, I don't like angry users, so. <laughs> no. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please, please. how much does fragmentation impact performance on I personally haven't seen an enormous impact yet. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I haven't seen anything myself, personally. 
I think the SSDs, I mean, taking out the seeks really, like, okay. yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, are you asking why? Um, are you asking? Well, oh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Example, right? Yes. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, file, file systems like uh, DXT4, right? Yeah. So, it's one thing in six, right? Another issue we saw is uh, that we can sometimes compress the data with the hole punches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, actually for both of I'm 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 talking about both of those cases basically. So that is yeah. what blows up the metadata? Yeah, yeah, it will, absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, blow up I don't wanna blow up, you know, like that's a strong term, but like you will you will be rewriting uh you know, the extent pointers that the the extent data the sets that I talked about, right? So presumably you could be splitting one up, uh so that might in introduce a metadata overhead, right? No, but it's it's it, mm, no. I mean, not not in like like if we're talking about one file, no, right? But it's something to be aware of if you're running it on a lot of files, right? Or yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't have like an actual no, no. That's true. Yeah, I don't have an actual number. Yeah, it's more of a a just understand that this is what happens, right? So if and again, like if it happens once, that's your. I agree with you. It's it's not really. It's not a really big deal. The leaves are leaves are about 16k in ButterFS, so there's plenty of room in a leaf for extra extent pointers and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's just it's it's one of those things where if you do it to one file, ten files, a thousand, you know, right? Things can could blow up basically. Yeah. So makes sense. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, so I'm a kernel hacker, so we just copy like the RB tree code from the kernel, and then I store it in an RB tree. Um, yeah, basically, so in in Dupermove we are storing. Yeah, I have an RB tree basically, um, and I'm keeping the hashes in in that, and then I'm using a SQLite database on the back end to store them temporarily, basically. Like oh, okay, red black tree. Does that? Binary search tree, basically. Oh, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't need. So there's there's two modes that Dupermove can run in. If you don't give it the back end, a file back end, it's just going to use all the memory you it can use, basically. In that case, you you load up an enormous RB tree, right? I haven't had a problem so far. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's the <laughs> um, right now it's right now it it wouldn't be used if you're giving basically the file back end, right? We still use we will still use a tree, um, but it stores a lot less, like an enormous amount less. We just keep uh basically the ones we know that are already deduped. Or the ones I'm sorry, the ones that we know we found duplicates for, we'll keep in a tree just to make a subsequent search faster. Okay. Yeah. This is does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah. The question I had was the extent. Yeah. Um, you said you said the extents are calculated in user space by doing the checksum and everything. Yeah. Um, but those really don't map to ButterFS's extents, right? Because mm -hmm. The because user space has no idea what those extents are, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Only the kernel does. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what Dupermove is, it's not passing up, hey, this is what I know is on disk as an extent, because you're right, it doesn't have that. Actually, it can discover that information via FIMAP, but it's, it's not something that comes naturally, right? No, you're absolutely right. We're passing up the logical extents, not the physical extents. So, yeah, yeah, so Dupermove is working on the logical extents, right, and passing those, those into the kernel, and then the kernel's resolving that, figuring out where it is on disk. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This is all handled within the clone code. So this would be the same thing if you 
clone one portion of a file into another. You're essentially doing the same exact amount of work, yeah. So, for example, as you, as you pointed out, if there's already an extent where you're cloning into, you're going to blow it away, and you might wind up splitting it into two extents if, what you're, if it's larger than the area that you're cloning into, right? So, you know, I mean, you can wind up from one extent to three extents, essentially, for one portion of a file, because you'll have the two endpoints, right, that were from the old extent, and then you're newly du deduplicated. Third extent, yeah. So that might complicate the inode a little more than. That gets into the overhead we were talking about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's um, it's it's basically the trade-off you make, right? Yeah. Um, again, like on a per inode basis, it's not really a big deal, uh, you know. Um, but like, it, you know, if you have like a really busy virtual machine, maybe I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, again, it's something to be aware of to understand. Oh, right, right, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, just to like, clarify about yeah. the memory, you said what you have to go to the SQLite mm -hmm. backend. Yeah. Uh, because right now, uh, what kind of memory can Falcon be looking for? Well, now with the SQLite back, backend, it's pretty much. No, no, I, 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 oh, oh, before that. Oh yeah, before that. Oh, okay. Uh, you would, you could basically, you could do the math essentially and say, well, I don't remember the exact overhead, but maybe it was like a, you know, a couple hundred bytes maybe, right, for the node, the RB tree node, right? And then you could, you know, I have a terabyte that I'm scanning, so divide that by 128k, and then multiply that by the overhead of like the RB tree node, right? So, for example, now if you want like a a, a more uh, no, no, I mean, uh, okay. I What's that? Sorry. Well, I'm saying you should, what we are saying, you will use two gigabytes per terabyte. Yeah, yeah, it would be something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and that's if you run it without using the temporary backend, basically. Turns out the run, I had not find, now this is running on this system, right, with the a nice SSD and whatnot. I haven't found a really big performance difference from using the SQLite backend, which is pretty nice. So I was happy with that. Um, I'd say a few minutes, honestly, if if I'm going from memory. Anyway, I have a, I have a lot of these numbers on the wiki as well. So every time I do a release, I run. This is kind of the test that I run just to make sure, okay, nothing broke, right? Bring in a patch, go, you know, set this off, right? And then every time I do a release, I'll rerun this and put up the numbers, so I track, you know, well, how have we improved or regressed or whatnot? So. Cool. Any more questions about this page or anything in particular? Cool. All right. All right, so, and I think that's getting near the end of the slides. Uh, this is essentially um, what bugs I found, really. Uh, nothing's perfect, right? You start, uh, you know, and you, you find bugs in anything. So the first thing, kernel locking is complicated. Uh, when we're doing this, we're locking two inodes down. And that doesn't happen very often in the kernel. Um, it almost never happens. The closest you get is if you're doing like a rename and then you can lock multiple inodes. In that case, you still don't lock down the data for the inodes. Uh, so this was an exercise in nesting an enormous number of locks. I would say about four of them. Uh, and that includes like the inode mutex. Uh, so it's probably not, you know, super surprising that we had one or two issues. Uh, at some point, clone was locking in the opposite order so that <laughs> that caused problems, right? If you did a clone and a dedupe. Um, the one that I'd say ever actually showed up, clone I just found by reading, read page was doing the opposite order. Well, I was, I should say, extent same. The IOCTA was doing the opposite order of read page. And that would show up as rsync hanging on some people's systems. So I get a bug report and someone would tell me, well, why is rsync hanging on the system I'm deduping? And then I'd go and then I oh, look, we're hung in read page. Huh, I wonder why. Yeah, there we go. So, um, so I'd say that was probably the biggest bug that I fixed uh, that you might have encountered if you used it before, basically. Uh, the, another interesting one was uh, we drove our sync crazy. Uh, clone changes M time and C time on the target inodes, and our sync does not like that uh, because it, oh, this file has changed, right? Yeah, so that is the next one, you know, it, it gets out there and then people are giving me feedback and one of the, 
one of the bits of feedback was, this is great, it's deduping, why are my backups so slow now, right? It's like, okay, yeah, so maybe we shouldn't do that. So, you know, I updated, this wound up just being a kernel patch and we just skipped that update basically in kernel, really easy, um, but important. Um, the other big one was we weren't deduping the, the tail of files. If the tail of a file was not aligned, I was aligning down the request. And it turned out to just be incredibly wasteful uh, because we would never remove those extents. Or you'd have like this tiny tail that wasn't deduplicated, right, on all these files. Uh, and that, that was just basically a bug fix patch type thing. So, yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, and all of this is, if you have latest kernels, this is all fixed in latest kernels and whatnot, so. All right. Oh, were there any questions about this so far? Yeah. Cool, okay. And so downsides of dedupe, I've, I've touched on most of these really. Um, the one I haven't touched on is <laughs> this one. Uh, don't dedupe your backups. So when you do that, you're just you're putting everything in one place to fail, right? So you have a single point of failure, right? Don't dedupe your backups. Uh, understand that disks fail. Disks might fail and just one part of a disk might fail, right? So another reason why you don't, you know, right? Uh, you want to be careful what you dedupe, right? If it's something critical, it might be better that it's duplicated on your disk. So. Yeah, please. Oh, that's a um, non-SSD hard drive. Yeah. Maybe not a nice term, I guess. <laughs> um, so on those, you know, you could uh, you could get more seeking, right? Because you're you're fragmenting the files intentionally to de duplicate them. So yeah. let's yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, maybe I can do backup speed more and then maybe go from uh, RAID 5 to RAID 6, right? right. Because uh, uh, in my world, when I want to infer backup, I want to see that, right? Mm -hmm. so in, in the, the, if I want a backup from two days ago, I want a backup from two days ago and a backup from three days ago, it's going to happen, right? Sure. sure. So, or to, in this case, I probably want to, to do them, right? Um. Well, okay, so I would say my objection, my only objection to deduping the backups is your, your uh, well, you deduplicate, so you're, you're, you're taking potentially critical data and, and uh, you know, making it a single point of failure. But you're right, if you have like a RAID or something. Um, so it's, it's maybe a, a guideline, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, 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 I was, uh, because if I can say twice yeah. Way, yeah, right. You then you have more backups too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Also, it, also, if your backups are, if you're replicating your backups, then you should, you can do dupe them, right? Because it's, you know, right. Um, so yeah, it's definitely case by case, right? I just mean I don't want like the poor person who's just like me. I just back up to a USB storage. So if, if I may, may not, might not want to dedupe that because I don't trust it to be super reliable, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Right, yeah. R sync, right? Yeah, that's right. R snapshot, yeah. In fact, I use the R snapshot back. So I'm kind of deduping my backups already in that sense, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's on the file level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah. So it's not necessarily due, but yeah, it sounds funny to say that. So. Um, yeah, any other questions on that part so far? Oh yeah, please, please. Uh, does Butter have any feature that like maybe optimizes the extent, extents and you know moves data around and tries to like reduce the I guess peaks, uh, a lot of peaks. Yeah, there's a so uh, I don't want to. There's a defrag process in ButterFS. Um, I have not had enough time to look into it because that's it's, it's one of those things that I want I need to look into because it could be something I could get, tell the users right. So hey, run your dedupe, 
right, and then afterwards run this defrag command, right, to, you know, to put everything nice again or whatnot, right. But I'm not clear yet, because I haven't had the chance to look at it, at it as, as to how exactly that defrag works. Um, so I know that they exist fine together because I have them both turned on and nothing's blown up and, you know, um, there's no reason why they shouldn't. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I don't know enough about it yet. Um, but that's my hope, is that that could fix that. I have some other ideas for it too anyway. Um, I talk about it afterwards, but does that generally answer? Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Uh, so the, um, the last thing that I found, uh, and this was interesting, was uh, bookend extents in Butterfest. Does anyone know what a bookended extent is? Yeah, okay. So I didn't know either, and I was like, oh, wait a second, what do you call this bookending? Okay, I get it, yeah. So uh, if you have, say, so uh, Butterfest is a copy or an I file system, right? So you've got a large extent, okay, and someone writes into the middle of that extent, right? Uh, when they cal that extent, let me make sure I get this right, they might not copy the entire extent, right? Because if the only part that's changed is in the middle, right, so what they'll do then is they'll write the newly changed data in its own extent, right? And the old extent becomes what's called a bookend extent, and only portions of that extent are used now, right? Because those extent data items that I referred to later are, are rewritten so that as you read the file logically, you know, you go, okay, jump to this extent, right, read this, jump to the new extent, then come back, right? Well, those extents cannot be split in ButterFS. So you lose that space for the, rem for the entire time that that extent is referenced, right? Now, this doesn't happen that often, it turns out. One of the first things I learned doing file systems is people almost never rewrite their file, right? 99.9% .9 of the time, a file is written once and that's it, yeah. So, you know, but definitely, yeah, definitely something I found. So that'll be something I'll be looking at fixing and it should be an exciting project. Exciting, I should say, but. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of, you know, again, it, it doesn't turn out to be a problem because most of the time the extents are really nicely laid out and the duplicates are very nicely laid out too most of the time, uh, you know, but it's definitely uh, an issue that, um, and it, it's an issue for more than just deduplication too, right, because it's, it's just a space issue, right, you can have potentially gigabytes of, or maybe hundreds of megabytes of data in an extent that's no longer referenced but is pinned to the file system, uh, you know. Again, doesn't happen too often, but something to understand. So, any questions about this stuff? Cool. I, how am I doing on time? I think. Oh wow. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, plan features. I talked about all of this already. The uh, incremental dedupe based on the find new command. Uh, that's like for me is really sort of completed feature-wise. Uh, it'll make me the happiest. Um, it's, we originally didn't support deduping within a file, and I don't remember exactly why that wasn't possible. It's possible now, so the next version will have uh, support for doing that, right? That just means that a file doesn't dedupe itself right now, if that makes sense, right? So that's, but it's possible, it's just the code needs fixing, so. And uh, OCFS2 can also, uh, does uh, copy on write for files, so OCFS2 at some point will get a patch for this. Oh, in OCFS 2? No, I oh. don't know about the files, like you just read and, uh, you know, check some. Oh, yeah, sure, zero. sure. You shouldn't be reading it at all. No. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's my question. I'm figuring out if there are open files that you avoid. Yeah, so, so it's turned off by default right now, uh, and that's just because of other reasons, basically, but uh, yeah, so we'll find map the file. So this happens inside of dupe remove, and then in the the kernel just understands the holes as they as they are. This is part of the clone code, right? Because we'll it won't find the extent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we find so we find map the file before we scan it, right? 
Yeah, it's it's turned off because it has nothing to do with holes. It has uh, a lot more to do with uh, what ButterFS marks is shared. So ButterFS, if it has a ref count of greater than one, it marks an extent shared. And I also try to optimize out shared extents, right? I say, well, if an extent is shared, hey, it's probably deduped already. I don't need to do anything to this, right? Um, it turns out, though, it's, it's shared if it only has a ref count greater than one, which means that it might not be shared. You don't know who it's shared with, basically. Yeah. Was my, right, so it just says it's shared, but you don't know, oh, okay, it might be shared, file, this portion of file A might be shared with file B, but I've also been given file C and, you know, right, yeah, yeah, so, um, so those are rolled together, unfortunately, in the code, so I just have to unroll them, basically, and then I'll use find maps to just always skip the holes, yeah, 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 another thing, holes, sparse files are, are, luckily, I found out not, not super common either. You have to support them. Um, oh yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have a database, that's a different story, right? Yeah, yeah. But in the world of like, you know, oh, I just untar some stuff, or I just edit a file, or whatever. Yeah, most of the time. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah. Good question, though. Thank you. Anything else? Any more questions? Cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, these are. That's my GitHub page for Dupe Remove. There's a wiki there. Uh, and you can get packages for most distros uh, off the open build service uh, site. So, yeah. And yeah, any any questions in general then? Like people who want to, do, I mean, I've done some call work. Like I wrote like a character device mm -hmm. and a block device and just some locking and kernel threads and stuff. And like I I couldn't. And so I took the Linux Foundation's like kernel training program. Really fast. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it's like impossible. Yeah. Actually, unless you knew what you were doing going into it, it's hard to get the value. But, like, I'm at a point where, like, I want to go back into kernel work and I want to do it. And I've done a lot of work with C, but I don't, I'm not really sure what resource to go approach. Like, what book or, or people say just go on the mailing list, like, this is the only place to go. Or, what would you suggest people who want to get into, they want to do kernel work more, but they're really frustrated, or the, which debugging tools to use? Because that's what the biggest thing is. Like, what tools, what are the best tools to use for... Right, 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 right. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So I'd say um, getting into kernel work, uh, patches, obviously, right? Everyone says, oh, put patches on the mailing list, right? Uh, the Linux kernel mailing list has an enormous amount of traffic. I don't actually know that that's the best place to go, to be perfectly honest, right? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say ignore it, right? Uh, you know, definitely check it out. But uh, yeah, it has an enormous amount of traffic. I would say to find a project in the kernel that you're interested in. It doesn't have to be popular or cool. It's just something that's interest, interesting to you. Uh, and learn that really well. The nice thing about the kernel is, say you're interested in file systems, right? This is something I can speak from, right? Well, it's, it's really well designed, right? Uh, there's a VFS inside the kernel, right? And, and you know, when, you, like when I first got, it, got into file systems, I was just filling in uh, callbacks, basically, right? But because it's all there, and because it's, it's fairly well designed as a whole, right, it's easy for you, once you started that small space, to sort of start to branch out, right? So then I learned more about the VFS, just doing file system stuff, right? Then, you know, oh look, uh, OCFS2 initially didn't support clust cluster-aware MMAP, right? So I got to learn about the memory manager implementing that. Uh, so yeah, I'd say, um, does that make sense? I mean, does that help? Yeah, yeah. I'd <laughs> yeah, yeah, pick, pick either uh, something that you like that's in the kernel, a device driver, a file system, um, you know, and just do small patches. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's that's definitely out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> like that. Is that the right term? Anyway, yeah. Um but yeah, that but so but it sounds like you have a place to start, right? Yeah, so that that would be something to check out and Well like other yeah. mailing lists, are there any chat rooms, any IRC chat rooms where you can go hang oh. out with kernel people that are cool? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah, kernel newbies is good. Linux net would be the IRC network. There's a pound kernel. But it's IRC, like just going on there, yeah, I mean. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let me what see. Butterfest IRC. What, what's the domain? Is it IRC so um, Linuxnet is what it's called, right? Yeah. It's, it's in my IRC it's client config, but I've that's forgotten it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But yeah, definitely, there's a kernel, there's a kernel channel there, there's a Butterfest channel, there's an OCS2 channel. Um, yeah, I would I would check that out. Yeah, absolutely. Let me think. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people send small patches and get started that way. Like really, you know, one liner stuff like that. What debugging tools do you use? Print K. Huh? Print K. <laughs> <laughs> again? Print K. Oh print K. <laughs> yeah. Uh come on, do you don't use anything else? It depends what I'm debugging. If I'm debugging the kernel, um, uh, print K, uh, obviously, like if I'm just, if I, if it's something I can run, right? Oh yeah, print K is the easiest, right? Uh, honestly, like sysrq, like if I have a customer machine and say they have a hang, right? I mean, you gotta start with that. So you look at stacks. So you get a sysrq T, right, to get the stack of all the running processes, I'm sorry, all the processes on the system. You go look at that, um, and then you work backwards from there, right? So like, for example, the rsync bug, Right, that I was referring to. Well, the way I figured that one out was I got a stack trace, right, from the kernel. I said, well, look at that. Uh, this guy is sitting in the acquire lock subroutine, and this guy is, you know, already has a lock because he's sitting in another routine I know, you know, or he's sitting in a different acquire lock subroutine, basically, right? And then your head goes off. I go, oh, okay, let me go look at ButterFS read page, and let me go look at extend same, and lo and behold, we're doing it in the opposite order. So yeah, I'd say things like that. I, GB, GDB exists. Uh, I haven't used it recently. Um, GDB for the kernel, I should say. Yeah, I make full use of GDB in user space, but this is why not. Yeah, so, yeah I'd say. A, no, uh, virtual machines are very useful because, but because they're fast. Because I can, I have them, I have it on SSD, so I do have a lot of virtual machines. I've got maybe four, and and I'll test in those for kernel problems. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're great for, uh, you know, because it's very easy to just iterate, right? So they reboot very quickly. You don't take your own machine down. You don't take a test machine down. You know, you don't have to wait for the physical hardware to boot, um, and. Presumably, you would be able to pause it, I guess, huh, right? That'd be kind of neat. But I haven't, yeah, I haven't gotten around to, I haven't had to do that, really. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe not so useful, yeah. Right, 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 right. But, um, yeah, those are, that's, you'd be surprised. Print K is useful, <laughs> can be useful. So. Any other questions? Yeah, please. I had some uh, just sure. general. Sure. From, uh, I, I'm not using it. I've been more in DFS space and, sure. and what have you. Um, but I, I've just heard a few things today about ButterFS. Mm -hmm. In the uh, the Facebook of the, um, you know, pushing their kernel code up yeah. screen, right? Yeah. They're saying, hey, ButterFS, you know, it's it's looking pretty good. You know, it's it's it's, it's almost yeah. there for us. We've pushed up a lot of, uh, we've, got, we've pushed up a lot of, bug fixes and, and you know, a lot of them are we're butter FS or they're almost there for us. Also something similar in the Gluster Glo FS, right? So yeah. there there was some um, positive there in the service there. Then I go to the the there was a little butter FS DFS. That was the more of a someone out in the field and I've heard this from maybe from other podcasts. Mm -hmm. like, oh I, you know I the data loss, ouch, you know, the on that end. So mm -hmm. maybe it's it, it's more I mean, where are the good use cases? Right, 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 right. Or right. the level of sophistication? Yeah, yeah. So ButterFS, oh yeah. yeah, so ButterFS moves very quickly. Um, and it's constantly yeah, getting... file systems and data, is that, how good is that? You know? Right, yeah, yeah, so let me get to that, let me get to that. Uh, so yeah, you, you're absolutely right, ButterFS moves very quickly. Uh, it's under, it's actually 
quieted down quite a bit, but it was under very heavy de development for a while. Uh, I think some of that, um, I mean, you're always just going to hear bad things, right? You're going to have, people are going to have bad experiences, right? And that's why you don't corrupt the data, right? Because they don't forget it, right? It yeah, comes up every single time. Yeah, absolutely. Bad, bad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the other thing I'd say is at Suzy, uh, you know, we kind of curate the features, right? So now, if, in fact, with SP, with Service Pack 1, we actually have a lot more enabled, right? But for example, uh, there were some problems with compression when we released SLE 12, so we didn't turn compression on. Uh, we, we curated the features. We looked through, we ran it ourselves, we, you know, what breaks a lot, what do we not understand, you know, uh, and that's how we got around a lot of those sorts of sore points, right? Where People might enable a feature, right, and then find out, you know what, well, this portion of ButterFS is, is nice and stable, it's had a lot of work on it, this is like brand new and it's just trashing stuff, right? Um, so I would say that that would be the biggest thing for our customers, for, and it's mostly what I can speak from, right, because it's, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, like, you're saying for, for SUSE, then you see you curate them and you've yeah. got the whole support channel, that's for your customers, it's yeah. very yeah. Because you don't let it stray. Right, right. And if you're not a customer, you could, I mean, presumably you could look and see anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not hidden. We don't hide it. You know, it's yeah. all our code's up there and stuff. So you could easily find out, you know, what do they turn off and stuff, you know. Yeah. Cool. All righty. I, I, I'll take any more questions afterwards, I guess, because I really shouldn't keep anyone here any uh, longer. So I thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.